Okay, so in this Baldur's Gate 3 video, uh, we're going to continue in our series, and in this video, I'm going to talk a bit about the Dark Urge, as I mentioned in the previous video, why I think it's a compelling character to play, talk a bit about that, and also taking a look at the new Monk class. A lot of people are wondering, how did Monk change? They know that it was improved from the tabletop version. We'll take a look at some of the changes to that. Not all these changes are known, because I think some of them take place at later levels, but I will tell you what I know so far. So talking about the Dark Urge first, here's what we know about the Dark Urge. Uh, I played again, my whole character was the Dark Urge when I played. So what I know about this character is that it's an origin character that you can select during character creation, but you cannot recruit this character. That means if you want to experience this character's story, then you need to select this during the character creation. And one really unique thing about the Dark Urge, which you probably know by now, is that you can change the class and race of this character to be whatever you want. So. It's really the background of this character that makes it unique and the dialogue options that you gain along the way. But otherwise, you can kind of make it however you want. And then you're going to supplement, you know, this playthrough with the options in terms of dialogue and actions that the Dark Urge would have. Now, I did read that you can run into this character. I read this on a tweet from one of the developers. I did not personally was not told this by Larian, so I don't know this to be 100 percent fact. But you cannot recruit this character, so if you do run into them, you would have to talk to them and either kill them or do something with them, interaction. And I will mention something that I mentioned in the previous video, the Deathstalker mantle that you gain from playing the Dark Urge, which is a very, very powerful item, uh, is only obtainable when you're doing their quest line. So, like, you have to progress their quest line to get this item. So I don't know if you run into them in the game world and, like, kill them, you know, murder hobo them to get this item because you really like the item because it's so strong if it'll be present on their body or not. Could be, it might not be, I don't know. And again, that really depends if they're actually able to run into them into the game or not. So if you're planning on using the Deathstalker's mantle, plan on playing the Dark Urge until further notice. So the Dark Urge is really interesting because it's essentially a character who's lost his memory uh, and is trying to figure out why they have all these urges to do really horrible things, right? Like they're killing people and they tend to envision things and then suddenly they happen and it kind of starts off with a bang early on in the game. There's some really gruesome, horrible things the Dark Urge can do. And I think a lot of people are probably writing this, you know, origin off because they don't want to play an evil character, right? A lot of people want to play that good character on their first playthrough. Maybe they'll play the Dark Urge on their second playthrough. But I want to explain why I think that might be a mistake. So when I started playing the Dark Urge, uh, I was encouraged to by Larian. I was like, I'm not so sure. I'm not really, I don't really want to play an evil character either. But I don't regret it at all. And I think the reason for that is while there are a lot of dialogue options that are really gruesome, uh, you can use them against bad guys, right? So like maybe a bad guy is being really awful and you want to do something really more terrible to him. You have that option. It always feels good when you're watching like an action movie and the bad guy gets it worse than he gives it out. So... That's absolutely an option when playing the Dark Urge as well, which I don't think a lot of people are thinking with. And even though there are a lot of dialogue options that are horrible, like things you can do that are just absolutely atrocious, you don't have to do them, right? Like they are an additional dialogue option and you can resist them as the Dark Urge. And why I found this fascinating is for two reasons. First of all, I feel like everyone has negative thoughts sometimes, obviously not to this degree that we're talking about, but everyone has moments in their life where they're trying to resist you know, exploding or, you know, giving into these negative thoughts and doing something that I might regret later. And I feel like I could see myself in the dark urge in that a little bit. And obviously not to the murderous extent, but just as a human being, you know, it's like not everything's black and white with human beings. And I felt like that was really, really intriguing to me because, you know, I've had moments in my life where I've had to make some decisions that my life could have gone a completely different direction if I'd made a bad decision. And I'm glad that I didn't. And it was tough, you know. And I think players will really relate to that when playing the Dark Urge. But secondly, when you're playing a Dark Urge and you're resisting these urges and you're kind of making the Dark Urge into a good character, it's kind of like playing the game on extra hard mode, right? Like you're playing a more challenging good playthrough because it's not as easy to maneuver through some of these scenarios without having a bad outcome. So I felt like I was playing the game on challenge mode, which was really cool. Not, you know, tactically from a, a combat standpoint, but just from a dialogue standpoint. So if you're looking for more of a, a challenge, you know, in that regard, this is a very interesting way to play. So the long and short of it is playing the Dark Urge, besides giving you a really cool item, I think, in the Dark Deathstalker's mantle, gives you dialogue options you would not have otherwise. And this is why you can't recruit this character, because the story of the Dark Urge is written from the first-person perspective. 
you are going to experience the story of this character from the first person, and it's going to give you more story on top of the story. So it's kind of like all that you gain from playing the Dark Urge is more stuff. You don't really lose anything, right? Like, you don't have to be bad. So I don't see, like, why if you, you wouldn't play it if you absolutely, unless you're playing a different origin character. Because you can still make the class and race that you want, so there's no restriction there, and, you know, it's just kind of more. There's no reason really not to play the Dark Urge, in my opinion. So moving along to the Monk, this is the class that I played almost exclusively while I was playing. I probably chained it for like 30 minutes to other classes, and I multi-classed it a lot, played it single class a lot. So let's get into how the Monk plays in this game. So first let me just say, like, I wasn't super excited to play Monk, actually talking to Sven uh, a bit about the Monk class, because he's been playing Monk a lot recently. We both kind of had a similar opinion. We weren't super excited to play it, but once we played it, really, really enjoyed it. And I think it might be my favorite class now. I say this every time I play a new class. It just feels like they're so well done. They're really fun to play. But the Monk's claim to fame here is a few things. Its movement speed is very good. It plays predominantly unarmored. It can use its dexterity to for its attack rolls and its damage rolls. And when unarmored also, it can use its wisdom for its armor class. So predominantly when you're playing a Monk, you're going to play unarmored, going to you know be moving large distances, and you're going to be attacking with, you know, typically basic weapons or unarmored, or unarmed, I should say, rather. So in BG3, you actually start with Key, which is the resource of the monk that's used to use their Flurry of Blows attack, which is a bonus action that essentially attacks twice with unarmed attacks. And you can get this from very level 1 of the game, which I believe is a departure from the D&D &D handbook, which I think it's level 2 that you get this. But as you level up as a monk, you're going to gain more and more Key, so you can use this bonus action more and more. And this is really nice because... This allows you to do something like dash with your monk and then still attack with Flurry of Blows, which is great. And one of the main features of the monk is that when you attack with a monk weapon or an unarmed attack, you'll be able to use your bonus attack to do an unarmed attack. This is separate than Flurry of Blows. Flurry of Blows uses key to use, right, and does more damage. Unarmed, you can use every bonus action if you attack with a monk weapon or unarmed. And what qualifies as a monk weapon in BG3 is any weapon that you have proficiency in. So... Could be a great sword if you have proficiency with great swords, for instance, if you multi-class or something like that. So it adds a little bit of variety there to what you can use. And then at level two, you gain more key, you gain unarmored movement, which increases your movement if you're not wearing armor, which I kind of mentioned before. You also gain patient defense, which allows you to use a key point to make attack rolls against you have disadvantage and you gain advantage on dexterity saving throws for one turn. So, you know, if you run into combat, attack an enemy and you're surrounded, could pop this as your bonus action, and then it'd be very hard to hit you on the next turn. You also gain Step of the Wind Dash, which makes it so that you double your movement speed. So this is kind of like dash, essentially. But it also makes it so that jump no longer requires a bonus action. So you can dash and then jump, basically, in the same turn. So it's a bit better than dash. And you also gain Step of the Wind Disengage, which makes it so that you can disengage from an enemy safely using a bonus action and a key. And then, again, you jump is no longer a bonus action. So then you can disengage, move, and then jump all with one bonus action. So then at level 3, you're going to pick your subclass from either Way of the Open Hand, Way of Shadow, or Way of the Four Elements. If you pick Way of the Open Hand here, you're basically going to gain like a better version of Flurry of Blows, which makes it so you can like knock enemies down when you use Flurry of Blows, or push them backward, things like that. So if you really like using Flurry of Blows as a monk, then this is going to be like kind of one of the ways that you would probably go. And this is actually the subclass that I ended up playing a lot of my playthrough with because I found that you basically need to be in melee range a lot as a monk in order to take advantage of the class feature of being able to use that extra unarmed attack as a bonus attack uh, or a bonus action rather if you attack with a monk weapon or unarmed. So if you're like shoot something with a crossbow and now you have a bonus unarmed attack but you're like all the way far away you can't really take advantage of it really well. You could move up and attack with it, but it just makes more sense, in my opinion, if you you know play a monk, generally you're going to be in melee range. It's not 100% true, but I just found from the way I was playing that eventually it seemed to make more sense. So then later I actually switched to Way of Shadow, and there are a couple reasons for that. Using the uh, Deathstalker's Mantle seemed to work really well for Way of Shadow, um, so that was kind of a nice combination. But Way of Shadow is basically, as Sven puts it, playing like a ninja, right? So... You gain a lot of like spells and cantrips that basically make you harder to detect, um, to slip by enemies, and one of the major features of it is Shadow Step. And what this allows you to do is essentially use a bonus action to teleport up to 60 feet 
as long as you're like in darkness, and then your next attack gains advantage roll. So if you sort of like maybe multi-class this with a rogue and got sneak attack later on, then this would be huge for you. It seems like probably a pretty good pairing at some point in the game. But this really allows you to have even more mobility as long as you have good stealth. Again, the uh, Deathstalker Mantle gives you um, expertise on your stealth checks, so that's really good for this, and also makes you invisible when you kill an enemy, which is good for this. So if you kind of want to play like a really stealthy monk that hits really hard, uh, this is kind of the way you'll want to go. And then the last subclass, Way of the Four Elements, was actually the first one that I tried and I eventually switched it because some of the bonus actions you gain with it are like ranged spells. And I just felt like one of the main features of the monk was being able to use your bonus action to do an unarmed attack, right? So if you're at like at range using a ranged weapon, and then you use your bonus action to cast one of these spells, that's great. But you have a limited number of key. So after like two spells or something like that, particularly early in the game, you wouldn't be able to use your bonus action to cast anything anymore, and you would only be able to use it for an unarmed attack. But since you weren't in melee range a lot of the time, you couldn't use it. So I just felt like, and I need to test this more, but it seemed like it will probably be stronger later when you have more key in order to deal with. But at the beginning, you kind of really can't take advantage of that extra unarmed attack when you attack with a monk weapon or unarmed. So there is a little bit of a disconnect there for me. I need to play around with this more and see how I can. But there were other things you can do with it, too. Like it wasn't just range spells. There were other melee things that you could take that, you know, gave you melee options. But again, you had to use your key on them. And I just felt like if I'm going to take the melee option anyway, rather than the ranged, I might as well just pick one of the other subclasses to play melee. So we'll have to see how this pans out with Way of the Four Elements. I think a lot of people will probably enjoy this subclass because it kind of gives you a nice mix and it'll be a kind of a unique way to play a monk. But I definitely need to spend more time with it. I think it's a little bit difficult to play at the very beginning of the game. Yeah, and a couple other things about the monk before I wrap up this video. They also have the ability to deflect missiles. Um, they can negate the damage of a missile if they roll good and then they can throw it back at the enemy and deal damage to them with the enemy's attack, which is pretty cool. Uh, you can't do it every turn, obviously, but it's something that's extremely powerful, turns the tables of combat really well, makes you want to bait enemies into attacking your monk every so often. I found it as one of probably the coolest class features I've seen so far. Very, very cool. But another thing that I don't think people realize as well is that there is new feats, right? We talked about this a little bit and we'll go into these more in another video, but one of the new feats is called Mobile. And this increases your movement speed, and it also makes it so that when you use dash, you are not affected by difficult terrain, which Monk has a very effective dash and step of the wind, so this synergizes really, really nicely. But also it makes it so that when you attack an enemy with a melee attack, that you don't provoke an, an attack of opportunity if you move afterwards. So they move in and attack an enemy, and then they don't kill it for some reason, they can escape without having to use a bonus action to disengage. So this is really nice for hit-and-run tactics, and I think... Some of these new feats are also going to make it so that, uh, you know, playing Monk is a little bit more viable than, you know, would have been in early access as it is now. So that kind of wraps up our video on the Dark Urge and the Monk class. I'll probably be talking it a bit about the companions a bit more in a future video. Also, I'll probably dive a little bit more into why I think Baldur's Gate 3 is going to be Game of the Year. I've said this a few times now, uh, both in videos and on stream. I think the answer to that is probably not what you're going to expect me to say, so stay tuned for that video. And we're definitely going to keep continuing our Baldur's Gate 3 coverage here on YouTube uh, and on stream over the next couple weeks. So for those of you who just can't get enough BG3 content while you're waiting, I got lots and lots more things to say and we'll probably, as we get closer to launch, start dripping out our guides, beginner guides and stuff like that for those who you know, want a little bit of information before they can start playing the full version of the game particularly if they're familiar with early access and they want to know what's changed, or if they're just not super familiar with D&D in general. 